have three brothers. Um, I have a youngest brother named Adam, but the, the fun thing about being the oldest brother is um, the memories and the things that I get to remember. And as a matter of fact, um, my mother completely denies that this happened, but I remember him being born and going in at four years old to the maternity ward and spilling over the cake. Uh, just to prove a point that memories don't have to actually really happen for them to be true. But the, uh, the story with Adam here is uh, a little more interesting. The, I remember going down to the state capitol in Indianapolis with my mother. Um, this was years ago, and I was in college at the time, um, and we were petitioning and fighting that he could get an exemption from the high stakes test in order to graduate high school. Uh, he had taken it six or seven times at that point. Uh, he had done all the accommodations and the one-on-one -on -one tutoring and the like, and we still had to have him uh, exempt because he was accepted on a full-ride scholarship to Berkeley School of Music in Boston as a jazz percussionist. And he was studying under Max Weinberg of the Conan Show at the time and uh, working with, uh, he was a fill-in drummer whenever Steve Miller's brother-in-law uh, needed to go home, he would be the guy to fill the stage. But the, the interesting point is years later, I'm, he's down in Greenville with me and we're talking about some of the things I'm out there advocating for in education. And he, he looks at me, man, I wish I would have gone to a school like that. Well, why? Well, because if I did, maybe I'd feel you know, not dumb. Maybe I'd have something to give to society. Wait, hold on, hold on. You're, you're a rock star drummer, you're doing He's a, a hands-on guy. He does handyman work as well as plumbing in town. He makes more money than me doing that. Uh, you're doing all these great things. Why do you think that? Well, I just I didn't do too good in high school. I just I always thought that I was, I just wasn't smart enough to ever figure anything out. They told me I wasn't good at math, so that's why I have you look at my bank statement. They they told me I couldn't read, so that's why like I just kind of trust the pastor every week to tell me what it says. And he, he went through this entire experience, and it dawned on me why to get involved in education. But here's the thing, and I want to acknowledge this in the room. We're all experts. Public education is probably the one thing in the room that we all have in common and have shared experience with in some form or fashion. And that's not to be surprising, even in South Carolina, where the number one employer in most schools or most counties is the local school district. So most of my conversations when I'm talking to people about getting involved in education start with them listing all the people that they currently know in education and all the experiences they have. Um, and everybody does that because it's certainly ubiquitous and it is a common shared experience. So how do we even start talking about new education paradigms? How do we start talking about innovation if we're all experts, right? Who do we listen to? And I'll, I'll submit this. I'm just a young punk kid who doesn't know he can't. That's a, that's a phrase I picked up that somebody wrote about Next High School in the local Greenville News when we were getting started. And I think it, it goes a long way to show that there's a lot to what it means to get involved in education uh, conversations. And I actually uh, want to talk a little bit about the story of Next High School and put out a proposition. And here's my big idea we're sharing. We're not serious about education reform if we only talk about the education principles and we do not talk about the organizational models that support our, our public education today. And I'll explain more about that because Next High School is a, uh, is a product of this local community. Five years ago, there was a group of CEOs um, of high impact, high growth companies in the upstate. There's about 140, 150 today called the Next Group. And I was a serial entrepreneur, CEO, sitting at the lunch table and we decided to get involved in education. And so we, we started with about a year and a half of vision groups where we just invited people to the table, slid a blank piece of paper across and said, if you started a school today, what would it look like? Why? And we ended up with uh, a really fascinating model. And I can share more about that, especially if you'd like to come visit. We have things, an iteration on project-based learning, which is impact-based learning. Our students don't play with monopoly money. They don't create science fair projects that end up in your garages. They actually do things, create real businesses, have real intellectual property. They do real nonprofit work. They really attempt to move the needle in the community. But that's part and parcel to the education principles. But here's the thing. When we talk about our education and organizational principles, the thing that everybody is impressed with when they come to next high school is how we do it, not what we are doing. Um, as a matter of fact, when it comes to our educational ideas, I'll try to give an example 
that uh, I think is pretty interesting. Um, and that's this radical idea that what if we stopped ranking and sorting other human beings? What if we just stopped, right? Which is, it, on, the, on the face of it, I would argue is actually not that radical, right? Like, hey, what if we stop ranking children? Okay, that sounds good. On to the next thing, right? But it's when it intersects with our organizational principles that now we have something to think about. What happens to the Palmetto Scholars? Has anybody thought about that? What about valedictorians? Right? How do, how do we rank and sort who, who does what best in any sort of, even if it is on the artificial spectrum of three different types of intelligences that we measure in schools today? What if, how do we do that? So when you have these education principles like, hey, yeah, that sounds like a good idea, I want to argue one thing. On the education principles, we largely agree. I, and that's what's fun about these discussions that we have. As all the experts in the room, we largely agree on several of the things like, huh, you know, schools should probably do this, and schools should probably deliver this, and maybe if they all moved in this direction, that'd be awesome. But I want to argue today that they don't, not because the administrators or the teachers, the students, the parents, or the stakeholders don't want it to move in that direction. It actually comes down to a basis in the industrial model. And following after uh, Ken Robinson, said he has a lot of cool things to say about this, but and what I want to point out is the industrial model, I, well, before we get into it, I want to state one exact bias to the whole thing, and that is the education model built on the industrial model is brilliant. If you're talking about scalability, replicability, uh, the ability to insert quality controls back between the 1920s all the way up to arguably the 1960s and 70s, I, I don't know how you would do it better for everybody to have access to a free open education at the point of delivery that's compulsory, that has everybody become an informed citizen so that we can have the rise in the middle class, we can have one of the world class militaries, we can have, um, although we may uh, have different opinions about our bureaucratic class, uh, when you talk about it in a worldwide scheme, it's the least corrupt and most effective. And it all comes from the ability for our public education system to deliver those things directly to our society. Most of us in this room, I would assume, fall in some sort of middle class uh, ranking, as it were, I guess. I don't know how else to say that. I, I have an econ background, but I could, I'll talk about it uh, in cornbread language for you all. The, the idea that public education is built on the industrial model is brilliant for its time. But when you think about the industrial model, think about it like a factory, that people would move from one subject to the next, there's bells and whistles, there's the, um, what we largely all just summarize as batch processing, which makes it very interesting when you walk into a school like Next High School who said, what if we put down the industrial model? What model do we pick up? And that's the first thing anybody noticed is our open space. That we said, hey, if we're going to move away from and start a school from scratch, why not make it look like a co-work space? Why not have the ability for students to build their own desk, have standing desk, that there's ubiquitous access, there's open access to all your teachers all the time. You don't have to wait till you're in a class period with them to go up to them. What happens if the number one thing, and I don't know if you all remember this about high school, the number one thing that goes on in teenagers' mind in high school is relationships. And that's the polite way to say it. And so when you're, when you're in an open environment, you actually allow for those things to happen a lot more organically, and it actually takes a back seat. So what you'll notice in these large open spaces, including at Next High School, there's a library effect. That by opening up all the walls and having open, flexible space at all times, it's very quiet. Because people are engaged in something. But the, the other thing you'll notice too, and this is probably the, the most interesting piece, and I would say that this is the belly of the beast when it comes to thinking about new education paradigms, is an open schedule, okay? The way in which modern education, public education is set up is based on this idea of time on task equals learning, okay? That's a, that is, we can, we can argue all day long um, whether or not that's a fallacy and a myth that we've just all bought into, that once you get out into the world after high school, you'll realize some, takes, some things take longer to learn, some things take shorter to learn, and not everything is programmed to a nice neat 18-week course. But when, it, when you think about these models, or public education in particular, we certainly are faced with the dilemma of what do we do when we've all bought into 12 to 13 years, 180 days, Six, six and a half to seven hours a day in high school, batching that into 50 minutes at a time with one teacher at a time. 
what do we do with those schedules? What do we do with this idea that time on task is what equals, is equivalent to learning? So at Next High School, we've actually opened it up. That there is no bell system. There is no more batch processing. Students can work on the things that they want to work at, on at their pace and in their way in a truly individualized setting, again, in open space. But I say all that not to uh, divulge any sort of secret. These things have been done. What it, what I, what's fascinated us about Next High School is it lets us reimagine and reinvestigate the why. It lets us go back to those education principles that we all largely agree on and reevaluate them and say, where do they come from and what can we do now once we have a different type of environment? Once we walk away from an industrial model, should we also walk away from an enlightenment model? The idea that the enlightenment time, this is where public education is also formed um, out of, the idea that, and I'll get into this, the, what the Greeks had to say about our lives and the ideal state of life, but we can ask ourselves why again. And we, we come across some very interesting questions. What is graduation? When do we graduate? When, why is that at 17, 18, that's the target time to graduate? Right? We, we ask these questions on ourselves all the time in society, or at least young people do. By the time you're 40, you quit asking yourself because you don't care. You're past the age of 18, 21, and 27. Right? So you can uh, gamble, smoke, drink, and rent a car. So you're just off to voting and you don't worry about it. But what does it mean to graduate? Even, even a tougher thing to wrestle with, what does it mean to go to college? Especially as our college models start to change and people have to ask themselves the, the value of debt to their future working at Starbucks, they have to wrestle with these things about college. And so what, what we discovered and what we realized is that we had bought into a different paradigm of what education is. And we call this the success paradigm. And the success paradigm is simply the idea of successive steps. And many of you have heard this if you've been around education reformers before, but not a lot of people have asked themselves why we got there. And again, going back to this in time that public education today is both out of the industrial model as well as enlightenment, they went back to the Greek th thinkers about 300 years ago and they said, what is the ideal life? What is the, the thing that we all should pursue? And the Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, which of course, according to Princess Bride, morons, they, they came to this idea that it was the leisure life, that the life, and I know it's, our, it's kind of meta to think that a philosopher would ultimately argue that the ideal life is to be a philosopher, but the idea is that we would all work towards retirement, we would all work towards a leisure state, that the ideal state that we can all finally get to is the one where we're not doing, that we no longer have to toil as brutes in the field as they said, but we can leisurely watch and wait. So we created a system of successive steps, Right? And this is the narrative that goes on in public education to get good grades so you can get into a good school, so you can get a good degree, so you can get a good job, so you can get a good house, you can have good debt, and you can go into a perfectly good family and a perfectly good life and have a great funeral. Like, that is the idea of the successive model and paradigm. But if you are opening up everything and asking yourselves to rethink what education is today, you might be able to, you might surprise yourself as to what is on the other side of the success paradigm. And I would argue that significance lies on the other side of the success paradigm. Now what do I mean by significance, right? What does it mean for young people to be significant? Or what does it mean for any of us to have significance? And this is a question I'm not sure you all wrestle with at high school, but we certainly put in front of our high school students on almost a daily basis. When do you leave a legacy? When you're 60, when you're 40? When you're 21, when you're 18, when you're 8, when do you start leaving a legacy? And when are you going to wake up and become significant? There's a, a picture that didn't translate that every student, when they walk into our school every day, they walk under a big banner like Notre Dame and they jump up and hit it and it says, your life starts here. They do not wait till they graduate to become significant. They do not wait until somebody hands them a piece of paper and says, you have successfully completed this step onto the next step. We ask them to wake up now. We ask them to pursue significance. And to give some contrary examples, the idea of um, success is design, or excuse me, success is one day being able to afford your dream car. Significance is designing a dream car. Success is retiring to the beach. Significance is protecting that beach. 
right? The idea that success is being able to travel to the Louvre, significant, your work is displayed there. And so when we ask ourselves, what does it mean for young people to be significant? And can we reimagine education? I believe if we tear down the walls and rethink our organizational structures and our industrial models, we will all finally begin to largely agree on bigger, uh, more audacious goals with our education system as a society. And we can get to those points where our public education serves all of us so that we all might live in a, a world that is better off. So thank you.